We're back on Soul Sisters. I'm Yama Brown. Hey, everybody. I'm Heather Hayes. And we got two special guests with us. Mr. Hill Harper, Ms. Naja Roberts. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. How are you? Hey. Hi. Hey, everybody. I have to apologize. My internet went off, so I'm I'm on, on my phone on my cell. So if it's not clear, I really apologize. That's okay. No worries. No worries. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Naja, for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. So um, you, you all are here to talk about something really spectacular that you're doing as it pertains to um, financial literacy in communities of color. Um, and so it is, it is a digital wallet. Is this, is this what it is? So it's called a Black, Black Wall Street digital wallet, correct? Can you explain to our listeners exactly what that is? Okay, if I'm, if I'm not spotty and choppy, uh, I can explain. But if I start being spotty and choppy, Naja, please take over. Um, you know, I, I, the, the, the Black Wall Street digital wallet, Maybe we should let Pierce explain. Hey, everybody, this is Pierce, my <laughs> son. Hey. Hi. I have, actually don't know what he's going to say. Pierce, what's the Black Wall Street digital wallet? Uh, stinky sock. It's a stinky sock. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the Black Wall Street. <laughs> so, um, They've been talking about stinky socks at Pierce's school. And I'm oh. so thankful, actually, that he's been able to go to a school where small cohorts meet. So he's been able to stay in person. So, and, and to all the parents out there, first of all, that have been dealing with this pandemic and doing homeschooling, my heart goes out to you. But it does highlight the issue around technology. And that's the question about, well, what is a digital wallet? We are headed towards a place where you're no longer going to carry a wallet, but all of your currency, all of your purchasing, all of your money exchanging will happen digitally. It's called digital currency. And Naja has a wonderful saying where she says, the revolution will be digitized. And if we as black folks don't first own the institutions that will hold the digital currency, then we will be left out. Bye. I Pierce, we'll be left <laughs> out and left behind like we have been historically. Mm -hmm. Yet we can replicate this, the group economic success that we saw 100 years ago um, at the original Black Wall Street in the Greenwood District in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where we had thriving Black businesses, Black entrepreneurs, we had Black hotels, insurance companies, Black-owned banks, doctors, lawyers, butchers, blacksmiths. We had people owning homes. We, it was an ownership mentality. And I always say this, what I believe there were three pillars that created that ownership. One, institutional ownership of the businesses themselves. Two, institutional trust. We trusted each other and exchanged with each other and did business with each other and partnered with each other. And three, and perhaps most importantly, was the movement of money or capital within the ecosystem where a dollar changed hands 60 to 100 times. It stayed in the ecosystem up to a year or more. What we have now, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll stop talking in a second, what we have now is that a dollar leaves the Black community within six to seven hours. And with the advent of digital currency and digital wallets, if we don't start owning these institutions and the, and the actual transfer of money within, you're going to see a dollar leaving the black community within six to seven seconds. We can't allow that to happen. We have to work together. Mm. We have to support and create institutions like the Black Wall Street Digital Wallet and then add on to that, importantly, ascending value asset classes of investing to create cross-generational wealth transfer and deal with the wealth gap. And that's why Nas Robinson's partner in this is so critical. That's wow. awesome. Naja, so I, I hear you are like a cryptocurrency guru. So how does that effectively, um, and I, I have friends and I have a lot of people who are starting to do cryptocurrency. Like it's a, it's a thing around my friend circle. So it has reached pockets of the African-American community, but I think 
sometimes in other in certain areas who um, have less access, it probably has not yet. What do you think needs to be done so that you can reach those communities that it hasn't gotten in those spaces yet? Well, I think the, the major thing that we need to do is meet people where they are. Um, because of the fact that in the black and brown community, we have 65 million people that are unbanked. Uh, first of all, uh, cryptocurrency is out of their reach as it currently is being orchestrated, meaning they need a bank account to attach it to this thing that allows them to be able to buy Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And so when we're meeting them where we are, we have to meet them in their neighborhoods with the type of education that's needed so that they can hear the words that they need to hear to actually understand this thing. So we can't talk over their heads and all of those things. So it all actually goes back to first the education. So we have something that we're gonna be doing over the next 45 to 60 days to make sure that we are meeting the people where they are to give them a, a sort of crypto 101 in the neighborhoods, in the streets, so that people can begin to kind of wrap their heads around what's happening. Again, not talking over their head, but education is key. And um, we've got just so many people in our community. You talked about the pockets. Yeah, it's a real small pocket. And so we got to make sure that we're disseminating this information through our pastors, um, making sure that they understand, uh, as he talked about, some of the things that are happening and what the di digital revolution is doing and how it stands to actually benefit our community. So we're starting with education. Naja, I like what you're saying about the education because that is so important for us to be able to go in our communities and educate on so many different levels, right? I mean, healthcare, financial literacy, these these things are so important and we got to, like you said, meet people where they are because they're not going to have the digital capacity to get that information. And then Hill, one thing that struck me so much with what you said is the whole fact of we're not keeping our money in our community. And Heather and I were just talking about that. You know, it's as soon as we get it, it's going out to somebody else. And if we could understand the importance of that and understand how much we need to get behind each other with us owning institutions. Um, it, it, that word definitely needs to be out. And that's why what you guys are doing is so important right now. You know, absolutely. And it's a double whammy. And I wanna explain what I mean. There's a saying it's expensive to be poor. And what that speaks to is the fact that so many, financially predatory elements in our most marginalized communities that we're offered. 90% of the financial instruments offered in marginalized communities are either predatory on their face or hidden pressure. We're talking about payday lending, where folks think it's natural and even correct to take their paycheck to a, a check cashing spot or a payday lender, where they're getting hit with 14, 15, 16, 18, sometimes 22% hit just to get access to their hardworking money. We want to end that on our platform, right? Rent to own shops, people paying 300, 500%. So many people in our communities, they're working three jobs, but they barely can make ends meet, okay? And so saying that we had even today, this morning, we were talking about, it. we have been conditioned to work for money, but have never learned to let our money work for us. And we have to make this shift because if we stay in the mentality of just working for cash, keeping our money in a mattress, mattress money mentality, we cannot allow it to work for us. And we will always be left behind. And, then, and, and if we don't marry that with education, we will always fall prey to predatory practices. Mm -hmm. For instance, many traditional banks have showed up in the black community and people have been, hooray, there's a bank here now. But what happens? There's a major bank, national bank, that's in a lawsuit right now over this practice. They encourage their tellers to set people up with multiple accounts, such they didn't hit their account minimums. So people had $600, $800 in account, but they're getting charged $200, $250 a year in fees, whether they be overdraft fees with their cards, whether they be you didn't hit the account balance minimum to not get charged that $35 a month fee. 
whatever those things are, are, they're hidden predatory practices. And if you don't know better, you can't do better. But what if we actually educate people, get them into a platform that has very low cost, like a digital wallet, and then say, with all the money you're saving that has been extracted from you, how about you just take half of that and invest it in an ascending value asset class like Bitcoin? But hey, 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 dollar cost average it. Don't take all your money and throw it in one day and then watch it drop and be like, see, I told you they were ripping me. No, no, no. This is a a, a lot of people talk about a one-year time horizon because of taxes. I talk about a four-year time horizon when it comes to this. Put If you can afford $5 a day, put $5 a day in. Set it and forget it. If you can afford $10 a day or $10 a week, we like Naja just said, she's so brilliant. We have to meet people where they are. And this is hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is a fight for the very soul of of our wealth in this country. Because if we don't actually deal with this wealth gap in this moment, in this window of time, we'll be lost. Yeah. What, what would you say? Because I was, you know, I was just thinking about, I think that when, of course, you live in little pockets in your own little communities, even if you live in, you know, you have a little bit more privilege than someone else, even as African-American people. And I just started when you, I think, through everything that has happened as it pertains to social justice and George Floyd and um, the disparities when it comes to um, health, when it comes to COVID-19, these things became like blasted all over the place. You had no other choice but to be hyper aware of it. And then I really just started researching and thinking, where did we drop the ball? Or because, but I also think it was intentional where do we drop the ball as it pertains to financial literacy for us in our communities? Because I've always wondered, like, when you're in school, nobody teaches you how to write a check. Nobody teaches you to save money. Like, they don't. So where was the ball dropped? And do you think it was intentionally done? <laughs> Not just <laughs> like, please, please, let please. me. I am like, burning. I'm jumping out of my seat. I have always said this. Uh, our grandparents, and I don't know how old you are, but our grandparents had these they, they were able to begin working, coming out of the military or whatever, uh, around the early 40s, I'll put it that way. They were coming out of the military and these different, uh, from our grandparents being like maybe the generation who stayed at home, the mothers, and then they got an opportunity to work, right? So then we had both the mother and father working and they got into these jobs like Ford, the aerospace division, they began to be teachers. And it is my opinion that is our grand grandparents' age, again, still right now in their late 80s, early 90s, or even in their, their 90s, um, they felt like they had arrived. Um, and so because of that, they got a little bit more comfortable not really speaking to all of the, speaking about all the past and the history and the, and the struggles that we went through because they had these quote unquote good jobs. And then it became my mother's time where we had, you know, they were teachers and they were beginning to get into the workspace. And then they didn't really talk to us about the struggles and learning about the financial literacy and some of these other things. And, and as the generations thought they had arrived and got these good jobs, they really forgot about kind of the foundation of talking to us across the table about economics and some of those other things that were discussed when they were trying to figure it out because they had gotten into the era where they were no longer fighting to be integrated, fighting for all these other things because they felt like they were there and there was no need to like really bring up the past. Let's just move forward. And I think it really crippled our community. Um, and I say that because um, one of my mentors said to me, that segregation was the worst thing that happened to black people. And uh, I was in college at the time when he said it. And I was like, how in the world would a doctor, uh, somebody with a doctor degree actually think that? And again, I was at a historical black college. And I realized while it was no fault of my mother's, you know, my mother was a teacher, my father worked for aerospace, but they didn't have any need to really talk about how phenomenal it was for us to circulate black dollars because we were so busy in that grandparent and mother's era trying to be able to shop where they shopped. 
patronize them. You know, they don't want your money. Why are you picketing to spend your money with them? Like why? So they just, they were so eager to just be included uh, that they did, they left us with this, this, this false, this false sense of, you know, again, we're okay because they're allowing us now to shop with them, to eat with them, to do these things. And I think that's where the ball was dropped, in my opinion. Now, Hill probably has a philosophical, but I've looked at, <laughs> I looked at this and try to figure out, like, where the heck did we go wrong? And well, was I was going to say one other thing, too, Naja, is the fact that it's not as much emphasis is placed on generational wealth and us putting money you know, it's, it's about spending or what you can buy, the status symbol and not in, or what you can save or what you can diversify or what you can, like, we, who was, nobody was talking about that, literally, you know. You know? Let, me, let me tell you this, and I, and again, that's why I speak from this perspective, because I had two grandparents that had phenomenal jobs, one still alive, getting about $8,000 8, $8, a month in his pension. And so what I gather from them, because every single two to four years, they either had one had a Cadillac, brand new, and the other one had a Lincoln. And growing up, it was, you know, it was always about stuff. And so when I got older, I was like, Papa, like why every year, uh, every two years, do you have a new Cadillac? He said, this is the fact. When I got out of the mil military, they would not let me walk on the grounds to buy a Cadillac. He came out of the military, <laughs> couldn't buy a Cadillac. So in his mind, I'm going to fix them and every year I'm going to buy one to show that I'm that. And literally until he passed away at the age 90, every two years, my grandfather from 1946 till 2014 had a new Cadillac every two years. Backwards thinking, it was about stuff oh, wow. because they had to prove to somebody that wouldn't allow them to do something that they could do it. And that's how we all, and in my opinion, from what I'm seeing, that's what we were about is gaining this stuff. And it passed on to my uncles and aunts. And they're all about stuff, selfish. I, I, you know, and I hate to say it because some of them may be looking, but literally that's where we had the breakdown was trying mm. to prove to people that didn't want to do business with us that, yeah, we could do this and we're going to do a good type of thing. So. so do you have anything to add to that or... Nasha said it pretty much a lot, <laughs> all of it. But. I mean, she said it beautifully. And the only thing I would add is that the re, you know, there's, there's, there's some very deep seated trauma based reasons that we have always worn our value, that we have always had to show our value because we live in a society that for 500 years has tried to strip us of our value and say that we are worthless, that we are less than human, that we are chattel property, that we aren't equal. And so, sure, it's natural that you need, my dad wore 10, 12, 13 gold chains and he wore all these gold rings. I don't wear any jewelry. I don't wear any jewelry because he taught me my value. Right. But he still felt in whatever way he had to wear that so that people saw yo that's dr harper right mm -hmm. he looked like mr t you know what i'm saying and and so but it was all gold and it was all think about this if we're able through a platform to educate our people about how magnificent and brilliant and beautiful they already are and then attach psychologically the idea of flexing with how many Satoshis you have, which is a fractal share of a Bitcoin. Mm. Our flex should not be cars, should not be jewelry, should be Bitcoin. Our flex should be how many Satoshis you have. You a Satoshi millionaire? Oh, you a Satoshi hundred millionaire? Oh, right. you a Satoshi billionaire? Oh, you a Satoshi multi-billionaire? Oh, dang. And you know what's beautiful about that? Is that it's digital. You can't see it. And so we actually need to make that shift mentally because as digital currency evolves, as, 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 as Bitcoin evolves and everything else turns digital, that unless we start valuing 
these digital assets and, and ourselves and not needing to show it, then we will still be buying gold when gold is no longer the standard. It won't right. be the gold standard. It'll be the Bitcoin standard. Mm -hmm. That's so true. So um, you guys are doing something really special starting in May, I think, and it's the digital um, financial revolution bus tour. Can you explain to our listeners exactly, exactly what that is? And name some cities that you guys will be, you know, embarking upon. Because I think it's multi cities, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so we will be taking this bus tour again, meeting people where they are, uh, in the streets, in their neighborhoods. We're going to actually just be posting up um, from, we're starting we're starting from California, going into Louisiana, well, Texas, Louisiana. Of course, we've got, we're driving, so we'll be going through every state, um, mm -hmm. but we're going to be making our first stops, Phoenix, Arizona, Houston, Texas, we'll be in Shreveport, Louisiana, we will be in uh, Oklahoma, we will be in uh, Missouri, we'll be in New York, we'll be in Massachusetts, we will be in Michigan, we will be in Illinois. We're going to be all over. And you can actually follow us and figure out where we're going on the blackwallstreet.com. If you scroll down to the bottom, it literally shows the cities and the days that we're going to be there is actually a 47 city tour that we're going okay. to take. Uh, all roads end in Tulsa, Oklahoma for the centennial of the Black Wall Street bombing. And it is critically important um, that we you know, that we build something, again, educating yes. our folks along the way. And that's why we're doing it that way. Because we've got to post up. We've got to, and I, I make a joke all the time, but I'm dead serious. You will find us on the corner where you see the kids in the background flipping on a dirty mattress, as Lauren Hill says. Uh, that's, the, that's what we, that's, that's the, the community that we need to work with and that we need to target. Yeah to make sure that they get ahead of the crypto curve. The only way this is going to work, and Naj is so right, is literally talking to people one-on-one -on -one because our community has been ripped off so many times when it comes to financial products and fintech and, and financial services industry that when it comes to people's money, um, people rightfully so are very hesitant. And so we have to get you, you, you have to look people in the eye and say, this is the future. Your money is going to be safe and secure. Make a decision about setting this up for yourself and your family, your kids and your kids' kids, because this is this window. And I think people will feel they'll get educated about it. They'll certainly feel and understand nausea sincerity. And she's been doing this for a long time and educating and onboarding more people, I believe, Naja Roberts has onboarded more Black people into cryptocurrency than any single person in the world. And, you know, that's a massive statement, but I believe it to be true. And so if not now, then when? And if not who? You know, if not us, then who? You know, I mean, this is it. And this is why we thank you for giving us this platform to talk about these things, because we need folks' help. We can't do this on our own. Right. We need people sending other people to theblackwallstreet.com to sign up with their email addresses and then to let other people know to do it. And then we can reach back out to you. We can educate you. Um, we need people looking at us, you know, going to Naja's Twitter, Naja's Instagram, go to mine. All of this information is there. You can DM us. This is a co collective effort. This is a movement. It's not just a, a company, a startup. Um, this is a movement. Absolutely. Awesome. And also, I want to add to that. We're coming to your city not to ask you to invest your money. We're coming to your city to help you understand Bitcoin. But we're also coming to your city with a gift of Bitcoin. So you're going to be downloading and able to download a wallet. Uh, we are going to give you your first fractional uh, portion of Bitcoin, which is called a Satoshi. So we're going to be giving out a thousand Satoshis redeemable when you download the Black Wall Street wallet so that people begin to understand how this thing actually works and mm -hmm. why it's important that they uh, get involved in the digital 
uh, aspect of money because this is an evolution. We have evolved. We are now in digital currency. What does it look like? How do you get involved with it? As long as you have a cell phone and you have access to the internet, we're going to show you by giving you Bitcoin to allow you to watch how it, uh, how it moves mm -hmm. and then uh, prayerfully teach you how to save and invest as opposed to doing what we do best. And we're, and we're going to change that because we don't do that best. We do a whole lot of things good as a people. Um, <laughs> but we are going to teach people how to save and invest as opposed to be spenders and consumers all the time. So right. that's our goal. Right. I think the work that you're doing is so important. And I see, I see a change just from what I see on the internet and social media. A lot of people are sharing information, especially with cryptocurrency. And you saw what happened with voting. A lot of people came out to vote in communities of color that would have never come out, but people were literally in the communities talking to the people and explaining to them the importance of that. And so I think the work that you're doing is really important. And you guys mentioned, so before we get out of here, please let everybody know where they can find you on your social media handle so they can keep up with you all and so they can come to the bus tour so they can get this wealth of information. Go ahead, Najla. I was waiting on you to unmute first. Well, you can <laughs> find me at Najla Roberts. All my social media is just Najla Roberts, at Najla Roberts. Um, and you can even, you know, you can find out about my company. Again, we are brick and mortar. We're looking to expand across the U.S. in our communities. I tell everybody I'm building Silicon Hoods, not Silicon Valley, not Silicon Beach. We are building Silicon Hoods. So, Look for us to be in your city, not just on this tour, but we are looking mm -hmm. to actually post up and be in your community to make sure that we're not just getting those individuals. And we want everybody, but we want those individuals who really need um, this service because they're on bank and we plan to change that. So that's it. So you can reach me there. And, he'll and I want to tell everybody it's Naja, N-A-J-A-H, because we do have people listening to us on Dash Radio, so they don't just hear us. So yeah. they'll need to know how to spell it. Yes. N-A-J-A-H, yes. no, okay. Roberts with an S at any, uh, on any social media. That's right. I wanted Naja to go first. But listen, I've been on enough chats with what I've seen it's a group of women and there's one guy and he's always going first. And then people say, how come he's always talking and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, mm -mm, I ain't going to, this, this, this is soul sisters. This isn't soul brothers radio. You know so, you know, this is ladies first soul sisters. The brother can go when he gets a chance. You know what I'm so, so, so I'm, it's just Adil Harper. Uh, on both Instagram and Twitter and, and Facebook. And the, the, but the most important thing is the, the blackwallstreet.com. That going to that web address and, and putting your email address in is a very important. You can also text me at 918-262-4604. That's 918-262-4604. You text me there, get back to you and, and, and we can engage. This this movement only works person to person. We're building in one person at a time. We're in this together, y'all. Dr. King said we're all tied together in a single garment of mutual destiny. So my destiny is inextricably linked with yours and vice versa. And, you know, and, and I'm about to say something con relatively controversial because someone told me it was when I said it, they were like, Hill, you sure you should be saying that? And, you know, the truth is the truth. You know, when we look at all of the social ills. We just had a young brother, Dante Wright, kill in Minnesota. Another fatherless child. When we talk about police brutality, when we talk about mass incarceration, when we talk about education gaps, when we talk about health disparities or COVID, there were so many black and brown people when we talk about all of the social hit us the hardest links, every single one of those, and that is lack of financial foundation in those communities, poverty. And if we truly want to solve these problems, mm -hmm. we have to 
look to self-sovereignty. And that means us solving the problem, us being our own reparations. If we have the money in the community, we can hire just like the wealthy communities, private security. And then we say, hey, we don't need police in this community. We got it. We have security already hiring people that are from our community who are working in the community to make sure things stay safe, right? We don't need outside police force people, cops and police officers driving from two, two hours away to police this community. Right. We're, we, we can solve that, but we can't solve it if we don't have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. If the education is massively, there's a massive gap, we can actually fund schools, charter schools, we can fund these things, but we can't do it. If, if there's a massive health disparity, we can fund these, but we can't fund them if we, if we have no financial infrastructure and if we're always in a position where we have to have our hand out. Yeah. Government, please solve our problems. No more. Technology offers us the opportunity for self-sovereignty. We can solve our own problems, y'all, but we can only do it together. Definitely. Absolutely. Thank you so well much for coming, on. coming on. We're going to continuously on our show and on our social media pages, continue to promote this, continue to talk about this because we both think it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, Kickoff is again. when again? April 30th? No, yeah. You guys, it's April the 30th or May the 1st. You're on mute. You're on mute, Naja. Thank you. Sorry about that. So <laughs> April 30th here in Los Angeles is going to be our first. It's going to be our rally, our kickoff for the month of May. So that okay. is why we are doing it that way. But absolutely, uh, we will be all of the month of May all across the U.S. So we're okay. super excited again. As Hill said, thank you to both of you. Beautiful soul sisters. <laughs> um, it's just incredible. And I, I really appreciate you both. Well, hopefully, you so hopefully we'll come out to the one in Atlanta because I think you're coming to Atlanta. Absolutely. So we'll be in Atlanta two days. We'll okay. be in two days. Because we got a lot. You know, I like Chocolate City. So we, <laughs> we're going to be, you know, you know I got to say this real quick. The first time I got off the plane in Atlanta and just saw all the people working that were black, you know, we don't get that here in California. I'm like, oh, like I was starstruck. Just like black folks <laughs> every. I just loved it. That in Detroit, it was just, it's just incredible. So we will be there two days. So we will see. I have to drive up from Savannah. See y'all. Okay. We're gonna okay. Definitely make it a point to be there because I'm in Atlanta. So we'll be there. But thank you guys again. You guys thank look you. out for the tour. We're going to go out right now with Fight the Power by the Isley Brothers. And we'll be back, guys. Bye. Thanks, Bye. guys. Thank you, Fight guys. <laughs>